Well, what is going on here? What is causing this? A wonderful concept was termed by a Dr. Bernershka, and he is a placental pathologist, believe it or not, the University of California, San Diego. And he coined this pr process of the moving placenta due to a concept, he called it trophotropism, responsible for migration. Well, what exactly is this concept? The concept is that the placenta likes a good blood flow. And it actually has been shown to proliferate where there is a good blood flow and atrophy where there is a poor blood flow. And the lower portion of the uterus does not have as good a blood supply as the upper portion of the uterus. So with time, if you have a placenta that was in the lower uterine segment or even over the cervix, with time, because there's poor blood supply there, it tends to atrophy and it tends to proliferate on the opposite side, growing up toward the upper body and fundic portion of the uterus. So let's look at this process schematically. A normal placenta is a discoid structure. The cord in most people starts centrally, as we see here. Now let's say that this portion of the placenta was in an area of bl poor blood supply. Let's say it was over the cervix. With time, that portion of the placenta might atrophy, as we're seeing here in white, and going up toward the upper uterus, it would proliferate here. The cord does not change its location. It stays here. And what I really like about this concept, not only does it explain the, quote, migrating placenta, but it also explains some placental anomalies, such as when the cord inserts now at the margin of the placenta, that is called a marginal cord insertion. Some people have called that a so-called battle door uh, placental uh, appearance. So. If this continues, this process, let's say now we're still over the cervix here and we continue to have atrophy and concomitant um, growth of the placenta up high, now you might have a situation where the cord is not even on the placenta any longer. It is on the fetal membranes that are here but it is not on the placenta. Well, what do you call this? We call that marginal. What do you call it when the cord inserts on the fetal membranes, but not on the placenta? You call that a velamentous cord insertion. And this is a very important concept because if this situation occurs and you have a velamentous cord insertion and these membranes now are overlying the cervix, you call that a vasa previa. We're going to talk a bit more about vasoprevia, but it is a very, very important situation because if a woman attempts to deliver a baby in this situation through a vasoprevia, that baby has about a 50% chance of exsanguinating. And that is something that is exceedingly dangerous, therefore. So this is what a velamentous cord looks like. The cord itself is not attaching directly onto the placenta. It attaches onto the fetal membranes. And as you can see here, it breaks up, as we see here, into various um, vessels uh, to a variable degree. So this is velamentous. And if this is over the cervix, it's a vasa previa. Every vasa previa is velamentous, but not every velamentous situation is over the cervix. So therefore, not every velamentous situation is a vasa previa. There are even websites that address this, and you can see here that this placenta has a velamentous cord coming over the cervix, i.e. a vasa previa. So what is the take-home message here? If you think about it, this woman earlier in pregnancy might have had a placenta previa. The good news is, if you want to think about this, the good news is the placenta migrated. She no longer has a placenta previa. But the very, very, very bad news is that she may be left with a vasa previa, a bad, bad situation. So a migrating placenta is not always a good thing. So how do we make this diagnosis? Well, 
you have to be wary of a migrating placenta previa. You have to be very in tune to where does the cord insert on those placentas that appear to migrate. You really need to use, I think, color Doppler to look for the placental cord insertion site. And I'll show you this in just a minute. If you see cord vessels in front of the cervix, it's diagnostic for vasoprevia. What do I mean by cord vessels? It's not hard to determine. You put your Doppler on, you determine what is the heart rate, or you put your M mode on, determine what is the heart rate in those vessels, and you compare it to the fetal heart rate. And if they're one and the same, those are cord vessels, okay? So here we have an example. You can see the placenta here. You see what looks like cord here, and you determine those are, that's the cord, and you see, you determine the heart rate there. It's the same as the fetal heart rate that is a vasa previa, and here is the cervix down here at this level. So that is right over the cervix. Here's a different patient. There is a breakup of the cord into its various membrane components, but it is not over the cervix. So this is a velamentous cord that's breaking up, and it attaches somewhere else to the placenta. These vessels do, but it's not over the cervix. So this is velamentous. And this is velamentous, but over the cervix, hence we use the word vasa previa. So let's look at a few examples. Here's a patient who has a placenta. Here's the cervix. There's a little vessel there. Well, what is that vessel? You have to determine if that is going at a fetal heart rate. You put your Doppler on in this case. It's going at a fetal heart rate. That is a vasa previa. So even though it looks pretty innocuous here, on the color image, it's not at all innocuous. This is a vasa previa. This lady needs to be delivered by cesarean section, even if the placenta disappears and is no longer on the cervix. The fact the cord vessels are on the cervix makes her non-deliverable from a vaginal point of view. So she needs to be sectioned. Now, remember a while ago, I said, when you're going to measure the cervix, I said, you want to pull the presenting part up so it's not overlying the internal os. You'll get a better measurement. You'll see the internal os better. And there's another reason why. This lady actually had a placenta previa. And then she was told her placenta migrated. Good news, no longer has a placenta previa. Then she came back in with a little bit of bleeding. And when we looked more carefully, that is by pulling the presenting part off away from the internal os area, which would be here, we noted a little vessel here that you could never see when the presenting part was up against the internal aspect of the, the internal os of the cervix and plastered against the cervix itself. So we started getting concerned. We looked harder and we were concerned about this and I'll show you a clip in a minute, there you go. There's a vessel that's coming completely over, you can see over the internal os, over the entire cervix. And then what you wanna do is to determine what is the heart rate in that vessel? What is the, how many beats per minute? This is at the fetal heart rate. This is a vasa previa. Here's an example where that patient had been told everything was fine, her placenta had migrated, and nobody made the effort to see what was going on over her cervix. And that is so critical. I know I'm emphasizing this point over and over, but it's critical because if that baby had you know, an attempt to deliver her from below, she would have about a 50% chance of exsanguinating because as these vessels tear, this is fetal blood. That is, she's bleeding out fetal blood and the baby has a high rate of exsanguination. Can you ever have an error and think it looks like a vasa previa, but it's not? Well, here's an example. This is the cervix. Here's the fetal head. And here is, these are cord vessels. You can see the, uh, you know, the heart rate here is going fast. It's the same as the fetus cord vessels. But this is a sneaky case because this is not the cord fixed over the cervix. As a matter of fact, in this woman, when you looked, where's the cord inserting? Her cord is inserting normally on the posterior aspect of the placenta. And she had a cord that was just sort of 
wandering and was in front of the head of the baby. You know, the cord can move around, the floating cord. And in this case, it was just in front of her cervix. This lady was not in labor. A few minutes later, that cord moved out of the way. Now, if she was in labor and the cord is the presenting part, that lady also needs to be delivered by uh, a C-section because you don't want the cord to come down before the head and get compressed and the baby become anoxic on that point. I think an important take-home message is if you see a placenta previa, let's say you're scanning a woman, you're doing a 16 or an 18-week survey scan. She's got a placenta previa. What I suggest you do is make an effort in that woman to see where does her cord insert. If her cord is inserting, as we see here, high up, way away from her cervix, even if her placenta starts to atrophy over the lower uterine segment, she is not going to end up with a vasa previa because her cord is not in danger of being over the cervix. But if her cord is low down where it inserts and she starts to migrate, she can be in trouble. And the reason I suggest you spend some time looking for the cord insertion, let's say at 16 or 18 weeks, is it's much easier to determine where it's inserting at that point in pregnancy than waiting until she's 34 or 36 weeks, and then the baby may be obscuring the posterior placenta in a case like this, not allowing you to determine where the cord is inserting. So spend a little time when you have a placenta previa in the second trimester to try to determine where the cord is actually inserting. Here's another example. Cervix looks like you know, vessels for sure, but when we put the Doppler on in this case, all we could see was venous flow. And what this represents is what we call the marginal uh, vein around the placenta. There's a large vein that surrounds the placenta. This is a placental vessel, but it is not a cord vessel. And so a woman who has this doesn't actually have a vasa previa. Now, if, if she's in labor, again, this is where her placenta ends, at this point where the marginal vein is. It's not down here where the cervix is where the placenta looks like it's ending, you include that vessel as the end of the placenta. So she, in this case, has veins that are dilated. These are maternal vessels. They're not fetal vessels. If she bleeds, it's from maternal blood. The baby doesn't have as you know, high a chance of exsanguinating. It's not good. You do not want to deliver this woman either from below. But sometimes these regress and the placenta ends up just fine. This is not a vasa previa. If it regresses and that marginal vein ends up far away from the os, she's going to do fine. She does not need to be delivered in that case with a C-section. So false positive vasa previas include what we call the obligate cord presentation, where it was just the cord in front of the head. That woman was not in labor. You don't worry about it. If she is in labor, she needs to have a section. The marginal vein that's around the placenta. And sometimes you just have dilated veins on the cervix, so-called cervical varices. So with respect to evaluating for placenta previa, very often you can determine where the placenta ends with an abdominal scan. I think a translabial scan or probably a transvaginal scan are equally good. You don't need to do a transvaginal scan if the translabial scan works for you. Um, so I think either of these can be done. I don't think it's necessary to say you don't do a transvaginal scan when somebody has a previous. It used to be said that maybe you could precipitate bleeding. Don't forget that bleeding is coming from up above the internal os. Your vaginal probe is not going up there. So don't worry about that. You can do a transvaginal scan when you're trying to evaluate a placenta previa. So I always thank Dr. Netter, um, whose pictures I use for diagrams, and I want to give him credit here, and I want to thank you for your attention.